more specifically about election hacking, a little bit about what happened, and a little bit, you know, of, uh, or uh, hopefully the bulk of it be, you know, how to actually uh, affect influence over our election process, right? So, brief introduction, I manage a, an intelligence team for Fidelis Cybersecurity that was involved in investigating the DNC uh, and a bunch of cybersecurity events involving both parties in 2016. I teach computer science and information science at the University of Illinois. Uh, generally, I focus on criminal threats, uh, but got brought in to do this stuff, even though it's more nation state. So this is uh, one of the exceptions professionally of me being involved in more nation state uh, geopolitical uh, related work. So go through this quickly because we all kind of know what happened, uh, and John also touched on part of it, right? In 2016, uh, in June of 2016, CrowdStrike was called in to investigate a breach of the DNC, found malware uh, mapping to uh, Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear, which is known malware used exclusively uh, by uh, the Russian FSB and GRU, respectively. So they use the same malware they've been using for years uh, that has already been attributed to them. Uh, rather We are not empowered by technology, so I will just project and hopefully if, if anybody can't hear me, just let me know uh, and I'll start yelling even louder. Uh, so uncharacteristically, four firms were brought in to confirm the findings of the states. If you've ever worked in digital forensics, you know, we work a case we don't share with our competitors. In this case, four competitors got together to confirm uh, the conclusions, right? And this is on top of what our intelligence community also did uh, during their own assessment. Right? Uh, Fancy Bear began in 2015, Cozy Bear in April of 2016, uh, based on phishing domains of just transliteration of a, of a couple letters, uh, based on the IT contract of the DNS, or the DNC used, right? MIS Department. If you looked at misdepartment.com, at the time anyway, it'd say, we're proudly, you know, uh, you know one of our customers proudly is the DNC, right? So somebody did research to do very specific impersonation of that entity. So as far as social engineering is concerned, right, somebody took some thought to it, right? Uh, starting in June, uh, somebody using the moniker of Lucifer. Lucifer 2.0 started releasing some measure of documents. Uh, those documents had metadata in them, uh, and, and the previous speaker showed how metadata can be useful in gleaning some more information based on what the person's doing. I mention this because of the high-profile nature of this. Many security researchers started looking at it, commenting on the metadata, and were giving real-time tradecraft critiques to the Russian government of how to hide their involvement. So as we would point out mistakes they made, they stopped making those mistakes. I mention that just because I found it was particularly amusing uh, in terms of how things progressed over time, right? Uh, DC Leaks was a smaller site that also began releasing information. Uh, most of their stuff 
uh, there was some overlap with DNC uh, Democrats, but they also released some data on Republicans uh, and a couple of military officials. So they set up sites explicitly uh, uh, to leak things, uh, you know, using, in essence, low rent cutouts, people who are not necessarily overly sophisticated, and we'll talk about that in a second. The Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee was also breached. Uh, that is the campaign arm of the Democrats in the U.S. House of Representatives. So there's actually, national parties have three different major campaign committees, one for the Senate, one for the House, one for the President. Similar characteristics of the DNC breach, so we're able to establish forensically a pattern of behavior, right? Um, it is very, as, as the previous speaker mentioned, it tends to be very difficult to really strongly attribute somebody back, but when you have malware and all these unique characteristics that you can map based on three, two, three years of observed behavior, you can start making a lot of stronger conclusions versus Hi, this Facebook account was created with this IP and this email address, and that's probably all forensically you're going to have. But when you breach an organization, you create lots of forensic evidence that you can map to previous patterns of behavior, right? So uh, we did a lot of that work to prove it. Uh, those emails were also leaked by WikiLeaks. Uh, it included some donor information, but clearly nobody concerned about monetizing it because they just published it online versus taking it to... Alpha Bay, at the time anyway, to sell it. So, no real financial motivation, another strong indication, right? That was an intelligence agency. John Podesta's email got breached. This one is a little harder to attribute, but we're pretty sure based on how the information made it to the public domain. You know, here is John Podesta's 50,000 some odd email addresses released in bulk in mass, right? And I mentioned that specifically. Uh, for anybody who's ever dealt with the press, if you want to get them to do something, you have to make it stupid simple for them. You can't say, here is 5,000 emails, go fish. The only reason the media went fishing is because of the high profile nature of this. But by and large, there was no attempt uh, you know, with this to drive a specific message, right? You know, it was, let's just create mayhem and ruckus, which that they did, right? But there's no time, hey, look at this email that says this, right? Now, earlier on, right, there was leaking of things saying, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, you know, earlier on, in terms of the primary, questions were shared with Hillary Clinton for a debate with her and Bernie Sanders, things of that sort. But towards the end of the, uh, the general election cycle, there was no attempt to really drive any specific uh, narrative based on these messages. According to the DNI report, the Director of National Intelligence, we did this big, uh, not we, the U.S. intelligence community did a big report. Uh, in the aftermath of the election, what happened? Made some reference to attacks on Republican officials, too. Uh, only one of those I had the opportunity to look at. It looked like commodity fishing. Uh, I'm unconvinced that that was Russian government or Russian directed proper. Uh, but if you know anything about how the Russian cyber criminal ecosystem operates, the boundary between Russian cyber crime and Russian intelligence is porous and complicated, where they will share information with the FSB in exchange for not being bugged about their criminality for some measure of time, right? Uh, so things might not necessarily be state-directed, but still find their way into uh, Russian government hands as a way to uh, perpetuate their uh, behavior. Uh, I mentioned election authority hacks also. There's a lot of talk about voting machine hacking. I'll come to that towards the end of this. You know, but the, the highest profile incident is that the state of Illinois recently passed online voter registration so that you can register to vote online. It is now being deprecated because we have now just passed automatic voter registration, so voter registration is meaningless uh, in, in the state of Illinois starting uh, sometime in the near few months. I don't remember the effective date of that law. But this was a SQL injection attack that, interestingly enough, was discovered by the State Board of Election because their database was falling over. 
because there are so many queries being hand, uh, pounded at it, they were basically brute forcing tables. No real attempt to say, hey, you know what, I want this information, I know this is a voter registration database, you know, doing SQL commands to go for the information. They were just pounding the database and the, the attack got discovered of, why is our database under huge load? Oh, look at all these SQL commands coming from internet, right? Uh, so no real sophistication there. Uh, to be honest, looking at that, I think it was just uh, one of these machines that SQL, uh, SQL scan the entire internet 24-7, 365. Uh, doesn't mean the Russian government didn't uh, get some of the information, but I don't know if they necessarily directed the operation up front. So some of the motivator are some of the motivations to uh, help defeat Hillary Clinton and to help Donald Trump. Uh, to sow uh, distrust in institutions, which is a very typical thing for them to do uh, when they do any kind of influence operation, right? They want to sow distrust in the existing power structure, diminish the confidence people have in their government uh, and their leadership, right? And there are obvious geopolitical motivations, which uh, it's kind of a mixed bag of whether Russia actually got what they want. It's clear that President Trump has not necessarily been the friend to NATO that NATO would like, but on the flip side of that equation, when Syria launched, and we saw a slide critiquing the U.S. about this, when Syria launched a chemical weapons attack against a civilian population, President Trump, in essence, called up the Russians and say, you have about one hour to get out of the base that we're going to level in response to this attack. It's like, no, you can't do that. You have one hour to get out. And then we leveled that base, all while President Trump was having dinner with the Chinese president, right? Where, you know, as uh, they were kind of counting on a weaker America, and like I said, it's a mixed bag. Obviously, our relationship with NATO is complicated, but our relationship with Russia has, in some aspects, gotten worse than it has been under Obama for a variety of reasons, and that's another conversation. But was their influence operation successful, right? How many people think the Russians were successful in accomplishing what they set out to do? And just raise your hands. How many people think they were not successful? Just a question, why do you think they were successful? They just wanted to create chaos. Create chaos. Yeah, if that was their objective, they, they, they did create chaos. Anybody else want to chime in? Ma'am. Sure, sure. And uh, to recap, just so the microphone catches it, right, you know, the releasing of truth may have caused chaos, but probably, you know, potentially, in a, in a beneficial way for society, right? You know, there wasn't a lot of, at least for the leaks of emails, and I'll talk about this, not a lot of fake information there. As far as we know, all the emails were true. Perhaps that may have helped the public make a better decision. You know, other people can decide, I'm not taking a stand. But I want to get to my other point, right? You know, if you think about an influence op, right? You know, first word there is influence. Was it influential ultimately to change people's mind, right? We have never really studied that question by and large. It's a hard question, and I'm not going to say it's an easy one to put into math, but we've never really figured out how many people changed their votes. How many minds were, were shifted? I posit not many. I'll show some in a couple of slides, you know. But did it undermine faith in institutions? I think so, but not directly. Not, not for the reasons they intended, or at least intended when they started out, right? Uh, and that goes to my key point on the slide, right? Russians are students, or at least the Russian government, students of history understand that empires don't die, they commit suicide, right? is that if Russia wants to beat the U.S., they're not going to beat us. They're going to inspire us into a self-destructive spiral, which is a good, probably, description of what our past 12 months have been as a society, at least in terms of politics. It's been a, a very self-destructive cycle that they may have pushed us into, but a lot of the pieces were already there. You know, we were a pretty bitter and divided country before the GRU got into the DNC. 
So as an example, right, you know, if, if this is kind of the polling data, you know, from June 1st, 2015, so before the campaign even really started, between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And about March 20, or, well, actually, starting September 1st, statistically speaking, those are flat lines. Not much changed. And if you really kind of, the big dips of Donald Trump is usually when Trump went full Trump. Not that Russia released anything. Um, you know, and you've got the, the movement at the end that's because of the length of this graph, you don't really see it. The biggest drop for Hillary Clinton was uh, then FBI Director Comey's memo. Right? We generated a lot of headlines, we generated a lot of news, we focused on fake news, but as you saw in the last slide of, of Melvin and the last name escapes me, right? these are accounts with no real influence. They're not influencer accounts. It creates a lot of noise. Maybe you can get a trending topic, but that's kind of hard. One of the uh, problems that they had right, in using a sequence of cutouts Guccifer was a cutout, is that they weren't particularly sophisticated people. Guccifer was one of their main mechanisms to communicating to the public. And in my conversations with him, which, since I'm talking about this publicly, want to emphasize I gave to the FBI, so my purpose is fully disambiguated here, you know, is he was complaining, right, that, you know, a reporter screwed him over, right? Didn't think he was going to quote his words. And there's lots of grousing about that point. One, let's just assume that's authentic grousing because you don't know how to work with the media. Why would you disclose that to me with a simple Google search would know that, by the way, I'm investigating you because it was not private at all that my firm was involved and me specifically, right? Was disclosing this because he was just kind of a dumb guy. He's not somebody you know, in a basement in Moscow who's been doing this for a while. There's liability of using unsophisticated people because they make mistakes. He had no idea distinctions of swing districts or geography, or really even how our elections worked. Uh, Julian Assange has some degree of media savvy, but really didn't care so much about our elections as self-aggrandizement, right? When you use cutouts, you can't really control them, right? They're either dumb or they have their own agendas that make them useful idiots. And Julian is a useful idiot, right? Um, you know, but he proceeds with his own agenda, right? They didn't really understand what swing districts were, right? They're releasing documents about congressional races in districts that are completely uncompetitive. He gave me documents about Congressman Bobby Rush. I don't know if anybody here is from Chicago. I'm guessing not, right? The only way Bobby Rush is not going to be a congressman anymore is if he dies, retires, or gets indicted, right? There is no way he is ever going to lose an election, ever, right? And they're releasing documents about it because they don't know better. Because it's very hard to understand the nuances of what people in a district or a country or a state are actually doing on the ground from large distances away. Russia has a lot of physical presence in Eastern Europe. It dissipates somewhat the more west they go, but they have institutional people on the ground who understand the lay of the land. They don't have as much of that here, right? So that's a real liability for them, right? Um, the thing about releasing some of the information about Hillary Clinton that they did, right? You know, and some of it was scandalous to a degree, but by and large, the public perceives the Clinton family as kind of sleazy already. You give new specifics to an already kind of ingrained notion, right? And I don't say that as a partisan. You know, the, the fact of the matter is if Hillary Clinton won the election, she'd have been the most unpopular U.S. president in history, too. More popular than Donald Trump. But by and large, you know, there's baggage there, right? But they never really tried, and this surprised me. I expected them to try to make up things, right? Because the Russians have been known to do that. If they can't find a compromising material on you, they will try to make it up. They did in the French election, right? Which, reference briefly, I'll reference again. One of the emails they released was some elderly MP in Parliament who bought drugs with Bitcoin off the dark web and shipped it to Parliament. Right? Absurd on its face. 70-year-old guy's going to get on tour? Really? You know, 
figures out Bitcoin, and anybody who does drugs is never going to have it shipped to the most secure building in their country with x-ray scanners looking for things like suspicious powders. You know, it's an obviously doctor document, and it's very hard to use fake documents because it's got to be believed long enough, right, to have an impression. Uh, you know, the French, unlike us, just kind of dumped cold water on the whole thing and then moved on, right? Because in the end, if the goal of your adversary is to undermine your institutions, one way to ensure that happens is line up all of the heads of your intelligence agencies and all of your congressional leaders and say, the Russians have undermined our democracy. Now the numbers don't even matter of what they did. Our own country said they did it. We're moving on because we have undermined our own institutions. I do not believe Russia intended that initially. I think we did that to ourselves. So, their limitations, I referenced this. They don't have a lot of resources on the ground here to work with. Um, we just cut the amount of diplomatic presence they can have into this country. I think only 455 people now, which means they've got to use cutouts or actually covert sources, of which there are also not many, and probably many are tasked on more important things than doing the real work of espionage, right? Um, there's lots of suspicion, right? You know, we're, we're looking for reasons to suspect Russians of something, right? We are trying to give the American corporate death penalty to Kaspersky for no other reason than, than the company is based in Moscow. As far as I know, that's the only reason Best Buy has stopped spelling Kaspersky software yesterday or today or whenever it was, right? No real evidence aside of that, right? How can you succeed being overtly Russian? You can't. You've got to do something else, right? You can't exactly vote by mail in Russia. We track addresses. You know, an election authority, the Illinois or Iowa State Board of Elections is going to be, why am I mailing 100,000 ballots to St. Petersburg? Probably should check that out, and we're going to check that out before the election actually happens, because you've got to apply for that over a month ahead of time, right? Uh, the same thing for voter registration. I mean, you can be an expat and vote overseas. People do it all, all the time, right? Uh, but it's very difficult to sit there and gain that system at scale, right? You know, their attacks generally have to be remote, and that complicates things, right? If you've got voting machines that are offline, you know, it's really hard to be on the other, half, other side of the planet to get into those voting machines, at least on election day. You know, you're relying on doing phishing to maybe up update firmware, right? But we'll talk about voting machines in a little bit, right? You know, you know and I said, all of you, I'm sure, have gotten political lit literature stuck in your door, right? It is one of the cheapest forms of political communication there is, but they can't really do that, right? They can't do normal neighborhood influence stuff, pay some guy 50 bucks a day to leaflet an entire neighborhood. That's just not something that, that's available to them. But they do have some things that are, and that's what we're going to talk about. But we're going to start with this kind of premise, right? Because you know, there's a lot of conversation about fake news. The New York Times did uh, uh, some reporting uh, Thursday and Friday about Facebook and Twitter bots and the like, right? You know, as far as influence operations go, right, in a highly polarized and politicized society in which we find ourselves right now, right, is a lot of people look at things from the prism of their own confirmation bias. I'm not going to ask you to raise hands, but I bet there are people in this room that watch MSNBC and do not watch Fox News, and there are some people who watch Fox News and not MSNBC, right? And there are probably good reasons for it, but in, you know, at, at the point, right, it's confirmation bias. So when you start spreading noise, stories like you saw from uh, world politics, you know, Russia or uh, U.S. intelligence officials discover no links between Russia and Donald Trump, right? Odds are, depending on your political persuasion, and the less educated you are, the more true this tends to be, you're going to believe something based on what you already believe, right? It is very difficult to get people to change their minds in a polarized society, which is both a positive, right, in the sense of it's really hard to influence the American public because we already have our minds made up when it comes to politics anyway, but it's a con because, well, you know, we, we kind of are in a self-destructive cycle right now. So, 
Russian sources spent $100,000 on Facebook ads on some of those things for fake news, and you saw you know, an example of that, right? They attribute that to the Russian government. I'd really be fascinated how Facebook can make that determination, but they did. You know, and you know, there are things you know, on Bernie Sanders' pages saying, you know, basically never Hillary messages post-primary. That is also being attributed to Russia. But did it really change anybody's minds? I don't think so. But they're really good and have figured out how to start exploiting this problem with us. Uh, Kislyak, until recently, was the Russian ambassador to the United States. If you know anything about embassies, that is where official cover espionage takes place. Every embassy in the world, no matter what country you're in or what country that embassy belongs to, is the most surveilled piece of real estate ever. So when Kislyak makes a call to Moscow on an open, unencrypted line, he is not talking to Moscow, he is talking to us. Right? And said, hey, look, you know, Trump wants a back channel to Moscow. Promptly leaked by our intelligence community, put into the media, and based on confirmation bias, people are saying, see, we have proof. Now, it may be entirely possible the Trump administration wanted a back channel to Russia. I don't know. I wasn't in the room. But Kislyak, reporting that over an open channel, that was him directly, indirectly communicating with our media and the people to rustle our jimmies, and it worked. You know, jimmies were full-on rustled. And he's done that more than once, explicitly to communicate to the American people from his office in the Russian embassy, right? Um, but how to get people to change their votes, right? I want to do an influence operation where, you know what, I can make sure Hillary Clinton wins, or Donald Trump wins, or whatever preferred congressman wins, right? Next level stuff, because I'll get to this point at the end. Russia is learning our system. They are learning what we do. They are learning as they go to try to manipulate us to get better outcomes for their national interest, right? And I don't say that with moral judgment. Of course they would do that. They're a nation. Nations act in their own self-interest. And a lot of the time, Russian interests and American interests don't line up, right? So they're going to try to get a better deal for themselves. To an extent, we do that to other countries in the world too, right? It is easy to get somebody to hate somebody else. This is a facet of human nature. Why are most political ads negative? We don't like politicians. We're inclined to hate them. It's very easy to make you hate a politician. I cannot create an ad campaign that will make you love and admire a congressman. There are a lot of reasons for that, up to and including many are just not admirable people, right? You know, but our political biases, even if there were, we would be disinclined to believe it, right? But overtly negative campaigning has a backlash. So instead of campaigning against, right, your target, right? I'm not going to, if I want Hillary Clinton to lose, I'm not going to campaign against Hillary Clinton. I'm going to campaign for her in inflammatory ways, right? And we'll talk about a couple examples, right? But first, targeting. You know, you need to communicate a message, right, to the most easily persuasible people. You have some raw tools for Facebook to do that. I don't think the Russians used it this time, but they're learning, right? I can target by age, political persuasion, interest, geography. There's a whole platform based, I can micro-target, you know, I'm going to display this ad to this kind of person, right? Uh, President Obama, when he was elected in 2008, did a lot of the same thing that is called revolutionizing politics, where I am giving messages to specific people based on my ability or based on a message most likely to influence this class of people, right? All of our political consultants and campaigns are engaged in influence operations of their own, right? They just happen to be Americans and we accept that, right? So focus on data uh, that allows uh, the ones most likely to change their votes. There has been a lot of discussion that voter records have been breached. What most people don't realize is I can buy the voting records of every American in this country. It is sold on the open market. 
There are companies like the one referenced in the headline below that not only sell who votes Republican and who votes Democrat, who's a swing voter, who votes in primaries and generals, right? They included 48 different ideological preferences. So I can say, this person's pro-life, this person, for instance, has traditional family values, so that if I decide to run a, propaga uh, a propaganda campaign saying X candidate is gay, those might be the people I want to direct it to. All of this stuff is public, they can buy it. There is no law to stop them from buying it, because people buy it all the time and sold on the open market. When to act, most of Russia's intervention in our election was in the general. I cross out this first line because most people think of elections. I can vote for whoever I want. Well, I mean, I guess strictly that's true, right? You can write in anybody if there's a write-in line. But when you get to the general, all the important decisions are made. Donald Trump was a Republican candidate. Hillary Clinton was a Democratic candidate. If you didn't like those choices, tough noogies, right? We had already whittled down the number of candidates. Um, there's 136 million voters in the general. Between the two parties, uh, 54 million, right? Less than half. The smaller the number, the more uh, influenceable the pool, right? What if I would have influenced the primary so that Bernie Sanders would have won instead of Hillary Clinton? Would the election have been much different? Because I don't think Bernie Sanders would have followed Hillary Clinton's hawkish line on Russia. I don't know, I, I'm not being an expert on his foreign policy, but, uh, that is how they played in France a little bit because they have this jungle primary system where if nobody gets to 50%, then it's a runoff between the last two, which is how Marine Le Pen was one of their candidates. You only had to get somebody to 20% to determine the outcome, right? So, easier to influence smaller elections, do it, do it earlier. So examples of what, how you can change somebody's mind, right? How many people have enjoyed a robocall they've ever received? And I am seeing not a single hand. Having run for office once, whenever my staff let a robocall go to a household after 8 p.m., I got death threats. Detailed, specific death threats. Not like, you call me, I'm going to kill you, right? The kind of death threats is like, do I need to get state, the state police to protect my family kind of things. People get out of their mind mad.